Now, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 3 and consider the messages of the Lord Jesus to the final three churches. In the prophetic overview of church history, these three churches, together with Thyatira, run concurrently towards the end of the church period on earth. As such, the message they contain is very relevant to us today. The first church is Sardis, some 33 miles south of Thyatira. It looked at first sight to be impregnable and majestic, situated on several trade routes. In its past it had been linked with Midas and Croesus, which gives us an idea of its past glories. Jesus is the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He is the divine merchant, seeking goodly pearls, with the wisdom and resources to govern the church. Sadly, he has nothing to commend in the church at Sardis. Despite the outward signs of good works, they were dead. Their time and resources might have been spent on much social enterprise, but it did not spring from a commitment to Christ, nor an obedience to his word. They were spiritually dead. Those few genuine believers were told to be watchful and strengthen the little that remained alive. We might lament in our day much of what calls itself Christian, but we are encouraged to be watchful as his return draws nearer and to work hard to preserve spiritual life in ourselves and others. The good thing about living in spiritually dark days is that even a small light seems bright. We should not forget that Jesus used a small boy to feed a huge crowd and he valued two small coins. We might not think we can do much, but if it is done for him, it will be enough. There is a clear warning of impending doom. Jesus would come to them just like a thief, unwelcome and unexpected. That is all too true of today's church. Few expect him to return, many would find him an unwelcome guest. However, there were still those in this church that had remained pure in their love for him and in their obedience to his word, indicated by the clean white garments. These would walk with Jesus. What a privilege, what an opportunity. That close relationship is offered to any and all who will abandon friendship with the world in exchange for closeness to Christ. It leaves us with the choice to walk in closeness to the world and its current morals and desires, or to walk with him in living, fruitful relationship. The promise to the overcomer is to be clothed in righteousness, his and ours, and to know that the transaction that occurred upon our salvation is eternal. Unlike many of the transactions that occurred in the city markets, full payment and full purchase would be for those who follow Christ. Those who live for him now may not make much of a name for themselves in this world, but in the heavenly realm their names would be known to the Father and the talk of angels. In stark contrast to the church at Sardis is the message to the church in Philadelphia whose name means brotherly love. It was built by the king of Pergamos in tribute to his older brother. It was not a great trading centre, nor a fortress like Citadel, but rather a cultural, recently built city to bring Greek and Asian cultures together. To this church, the Lord had nothing but commendation. He is the one who opens doors of opportunity that none can shut or closes doors that none can open. From Isaiah 22 verse 22, we can see that the key of David is an Old Testament reference to the absolute sovereignty of God. Everything that happens within the true church is under his authority and he does not make mistakes. He is not about to ruin his track record of perfection on me. At the end of time, it will be clearly seen that all that he purposed to do has been done. We really need to remember this when we're tempted to think that if I don't do such and such, everything will come crashing down. 
The message to this church shows that there is still opportunity to serve God now. Saul asked the Lord on the road to Damascus, Lord, what will you have me to do? That is still a great question for each one of us to ask today. It also shows that there are those who claim to be the people of God, but were in reality opposed to God, the synagogue of Satan. Those today who cast doubt on the reliability of the Bible, the unique person and work of the Lord Jesus, and the only means of salvation, would fall into this category. They may call themselves Christian, but in reality they are utterly opposed to God. A wonderful promise is then given to this church. For those who did not give in but rather persevered, Jesus would keep them from the hour of trouble that was coming. Three things are of note in this. First, it is the hour of tribulation. Jesus had referred to this in his teaching on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24 and verse 21. Though Daniel 9 suggests that this will last for at least seven years, the hour refers to a fixed, specific period of time. Compare to the Lord's own words, my hour has not yet come. Second, the scope is outlined in the words that shall come upon the whole world. Though clearly future, when the message was given, and we believe still is, a time of great trouble will be allowed by God to afflict the whole world. Why? Third, to test those who dwell on the earth. Genuine Christians are not those who dwell upon the earth. We are heavenly citizens and pilgrims here upon earth. Those who have made their settled home here on earth with no thought of God and heaven are here in view. They will experience this time of trouble and it will take this trouble to bring them to accept his authority and rule over the earth. Don't give up. He is coming quickly. Though nearly 2,000 years have passed, he is still coming quickly and we need to be ready. We should not settle down in this world. We should not lose sight of our pilgrim character, but remember where our true home lies. To the overcomer is the promise to be a visible witness to the presence of God, the pillar in his temple. It indicates a settled closeness to God. We may wander in this life. We will be settled in his presence in the world to come. We will clearly be known as those who belong to him. Lastly comes the message to the church in Laodicea. This city lay 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia and almost due east of Ephesus. So we have come in a round circuit journey of these seven churches. It was close to Colossae and Hierapolis. The letter Paul wrote to Colossae was also probably read in Laodicea. Colossae was known for its relaxing hot springs. Hierapolis for its refreshing cold water supply. The water to Laodicea was neither hot nor cold, neither refreshing nor relaxing, good for nothing. So Jesus has nothing good to say about the church here. He was the one with the final say, the faithful and true witness who accurately knows and judges all things. From him, whether in the physical creation or in the new spiritual creation, all things have their origin. Such a judge has pronounced that this lukewarm, good-for-nothing church was about to be spewed out of his mouth. Of course, that is not how the church saw itself. They thought that they were rich, that they were seeing, that they were well clothed. Laodicea was affluent, had a medical school and a thriving textile industry. They thought that their need for God was redundant due to their own self-provision. Little did they realise that, in God's eyes, they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Human provision is no substitute for that which can alone come from God. 
even here, there was hope. Jesus' advice was to buy from him all that they needed. His resources are sufficient for all Christians, even those living in a church like Laodicea. He is more than able to provide all that we need if we will only come to him in total dependence. His love disciplines his children to make them fit to bear his name. 1 Peter 4.17 clearly indicates that his judgment will begin with his people before it falls upon the world at large. We should not be surprised if his discipline to correct and improve us is experienced now. How sad it is that verse 20 indicates the true position of the Lord Jesus outside of this church, knocking, waiting to be allowed in. Though often used in the preaching of the gospel, this verse is a solemn warning to me today. I may say and do the right things and appear to be a fine Christian, but is Jesus a stranger in my life? What is true of me as an individual is true of a local church or the church globally. Have we created something that leaves Jesus on the outside of things? If the church will not welcome Jesus in, then we need to go out to him and to share in his rejection. In doing so, we are given the promise that one day we will sit with him on his throne, for he must reign.